what is the number one most important skill you need to master if you want to confidently achieve a great bagpipe sound that is full, rich, steady, easy to tune, and stays in tune. It's what we pipers call steady blowing. Today we're going to take a deep look into the concept of steady blowing. What exactly is it? Why is it so important? Why is it so challenging to master? What are the most common mistakes that pipers make when trying to learn to blow steady? What specific things should you practice to become steadier and more confident with your blowing? I'm going to show you a powerful tool that I've designed and created specifically to help you improve both your blowing strength and steadiness. It's called the bagpipe cage, and I'll show it to you up close, detailing how you can use it to tackle all of the challenges you have in learning to blow steady, and how the bagpipe cage can help you make your pipes more efficient and easier to play. So whether you're still learning to blow steady, or if you're an experienced player looking to elevate your tone and steadiness to the next level, whether you play on your own, in a band, in competitions, or just for fun, you know that you'll enjoy playing so much more and with greater confidence when your pipes sound and feel great. And a big part of that is steady blowing. So stick around, you're gonna love this video. Welcome to bagpipelessons.com where you'll find the inspiration and knowledge to fulfill your piping dreams. The video you're about to watch was recorded during a live group class I hosted for members of my BagpipeLessons.com inner circle. With your membership, you gain full access to the very best at BagpipeLessons.com. This includes weekly live interactive classes for pipers of all skill levels, led by me and world champion guest instructors. You'll also get access to my exclusive lesson library filled with hundreds of videos, lessons, tunes, product demonstrations, and more, covering nearly every topic in piping. And you get personalized support from me to help you achieve your piping goals. To find out more about the Inner Circle, please visit bagpipelessons.com slash membership. You might notice that this video looks a little bit different from what you're seeing now. That's because it was recorded before I got this sweet studio set up. But the information is as valuable as ever, and I hope you find it helpful. Okay. How'd that sound? Does that sound okay? I don't think I've played my pipes on the, on the, uh, in the group yet. Hear me okay out there? Yeah, it sounds, it sounds great. It sounds great to me. You're right. Well, okay, cool. Very fun. I was just trying a different, uh, different microphone for that than I, than I usually mm -hmm. just be talking. But welcome, everybody. Happy Friday to you. Excited about today's topic. We're going to talk about getting a good sound and um, in particular well that's actually not the topic of what i said it was going to be but that's it's about getting a good sound it's how to achieve perfectly steady blowing pressure so what i want to talk about before we get into it is why is it so important you know we pipers we spend a lot of time talking about it 
um, practicing it, if you're doing things properly, you're working on your steady blowing. Why is it so important? Silence, complete silence. No, 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 you're, I think we're all thinking. Um, Good. Hi, Bob. Hey, doing great. Haven't seen you for a while, but I uh, hope too soon. And, and I actually made it to one of these, so that's pretty good, right? Right. I know you've been watching um, the replay, but great to see you live. Yeah, so the uh, so, so steady pressure, of course, with the steady pressure, you get a steady, t a steady tone, specifically out of your drones. And if you vary your pressure, as you know, I'm pretty darn good at varying mine, uh, your drones are all over the spectrum, and you don't get a good, clean sound from your tune. Absolutely. Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, John types in the chat, pitch changes with pressure. That's exactly right. The, the, the pressure that you're blowing a reed will affect the quality of the sound of the reed and also the pitch. Now, if you had a magic reed, the theoretical ideal perfect reed wouldn't change pitch at all with pressure changes. And the reeds have come a really long way in that department. Like the channel reeds that I'm playing now are very, very resistant to changing pitch from changing pressure, but still there's, it, it, it will vary a little bit. And here's the other thing. You have reeds in the drones too. So you have four reeds going at one time. So that means any pressure fluctuations in the bag are gonna affect all four of those reads and they're going to affect them all differently you know there's no scenario where you could say well i just blow a little bit harder and then all my drones just move the same amount of pitch it doesn't work that way they're all going to move different amounts so um the things that make a really good bagpipe sound would be the quality of the sound you know sort of the the particular qualities is it warm and rich or is it thin um, the volume of the sound, um, the in-tuneness of the instrument is really, really important, right? Bagpipe can sound wonderful, and it can sound really bad if you just detune the drone. So having everything be really in tune is really, really important. And to get to Bob's point that you, you brought up at the beginning there, which is if your pressure is moving around, you won't be able to get those things in tune or they'll be in tune momentarily and then they're going to be going in and out of tune. So a common question that I get from students when they're just getting going on their pipes in the early days is, okay, great, now I can blow these things and make them sound. Now how do I tune them? That's a natural question, but it's very, very hard to tune them properly with any success if the pressure is moving around a lot. So um we might get a little bit into that with that student at that time but most of that conversation i'm going to steer it over towards let's talk about getting really really steady with the bag pressure and then when we spend a little bit more time and get into detail on tuning things it's going to be more doable does that make sense so if you listen to a bunch of pipers and even really good pipers the thing that stands out to me from the, the pipers that get that sound that you go, wow, that sounds great. Whoa, beautiful sound. One of the things that stand out is, is like a wall of sound coming from the drones, right? So it can be, somebody else could be really, really pr precisely tuned, but if the drones are a little bit quiet or thin or the chander is a little bit too loud in relation to the drones, it has kind of a harsher sound to it. It doesn't have the warmth and it doesn't have this kind of room filling sound that you get from a full drone sound that's perfectly tuned. And if it's not perfectly tuned, you need to get that wah, wah, wah thing. And even if it's close, you may not get the wah, wah, wah that you can hear, but you'll hear a very slight shifting in the sound, you know, just like a very slight change over time and it is a wah wah kind of one of these beats but it's just very slow can't really pinpoint it but you can hear that the sound is moving as opposed to if it's perfectly in tune it's just a uniform sound that doesn't change and that's what you're going for that's a that really really good bagpipe tone comes from that you can only achieve that if you're blowing perfectly steady because if your if your pressure is is 
fluctuating on the highs and lows, those drones are going to be going in and out. Even if it's slight, they will go out of tune. So that's one thing that's really important is for that perfect, beautiful drone sound that you have a foundation of steady pressure in your bag so that when you do tune your drones, when you tune them to whatever pitch you tune them to, that they stay, right? So a lot of the stuff that we talk about in terms of getting the a great sound from our instrument comes down to um, improving the stability of everything, right? So we want to really have a, st a, a, a steady drone sound so we have stable air pressure inside the bag. And then we want to use moisture control systems so that the amount of moisture inside the bag is stable. We use our tone protector so that when we pull our channel reed out, there's a, we're starting from a good stable moisture content in the cane itself. So all these things are about stability so that as much as possible, things are not moving around. They're not moving around from moisture. They're not moving around from temperature. They're not moving around from pressure changes. Everything is holding. And then once you have that, you can tune them. Right, and some sets of reeds and drone reeds and different makes of pipes are more stable. They're known for being more stable than others, but regardless of what your setup is, you're going to want to have you know those things sorted out: your maintenance, your moisture control, and then your 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 blowing pressure. Now, as far as the chanter goes, you know if you want to have a really really good in tune channel, you're gonna have a lot of tape on there. You're gonna have tape on certain notes. And the reason we put tape on the notes is to sharpen or to flatten the those particular notes. And then we can do a lot, you know, we can move the read up and down. That's a whole other topic. But if you really want it to be in tune, a little slight adjustment in that tape, maybe even like a millimeter, can make a difference between it sounding really nice or not quite right or really bad. And the only way you're going to be able to make those fine tuning adjustments on the tuning of the individual notes on your chanter is if it's not moving around on you, right? So if you're blowing perfectly steady, you'll be able to either using your ear or using a tuner go, oh, that note's a little bit off. You make your adjustment with your tape, you put it back on, and the next time you play it, it's spot on. If your pressure is moving, those notes are going to be moving around. It's going to be impossible. You're going to be chasing your own tail there. So. There's some uh, old story about building your house on a solid foundation, right? not on shifting sands. So that's the idea here. We want to try to eliminate all those variables. And the one thing that is different about the blowing steady topic is it's, um, it's something that you do continuously while you're playing. You know, it's not like, oh, I got a new tone protector, so that's good. Or I got my new canister system, so that's good. Or I got, you know, it's not, it's not an equipment thing. It's something that you do every time you play. If you talk to other musicians, they talk about intonation. And depending on the instrument, there are different ways that they um, create the sound. It's not always just tuning it, a set it and forget it thing. For violinists, it's every time that they draw the bow across the string. It's how fast they draw the bow. It's the pressure which, that they draw the bow. It's where they put their finger. It's how hard they push. With the singer, it's about breath control and it's about how much sort of how fast you're exhaling and all that stuff. So you can talk to different musicians and there's a lot of work that goes into getting the sound out of their instrument or their voice. For pipers, we're, it's, it's all about um, the blowing steady. That's the thing that you're continuously doing while you're playing to maintain that good sound. I remember when I was playing with uh, the Simon Fraser University Pipe Band years ago. It was probably 15 years ago at least, and maybe 20. And we were on our way back from a competition on the bus. And we had a good day. And um, to celebrate, someone was playing their pipes on the bus. And then they're passing around, and they're passing around this guy's pipes on the bus. And it was actually Andrew Bonar, a great piper and friend of mine who's no longer with us. but. Boney got an amazing sound out of those pipes. And when he played them, he got that amazing sound, his pipes. And nobody else got that sound out of his pipes. Even really good players on that bus playing, nobody got that bony sound out of his pipes just because people were blowing them slightly differently. Now, for me, the blowpipe was really long and I was sitting on a bus and it was hard for me to do. But I definitely could, I was hearing, these, are, these don't sound like his pipes. 
these sound not so good because I wasn't blowing them exactly right. Not only is the steadiness important, but hitting the exact right pressure is important. So we'll talk about that today. What does steady blowing mean? Well, it's not really blowing. That's a misnomer. It's really about steady pressure in the bag. And that is created with the combination of blowing and squeezing. It can't all, it can't be just from blowing because you're blowing intermittently. You're blowing, you're taking a breath. You're blowing, you're taking a breath. What's constant is the arm, right? The arm is the constant thing on the bag. And um, often with people when they're first getting on the pipes, it looks like what pipers are doing is squeezing the bag. And then when they blow into it, releasing the arm to blow into the bag. So it looks like a squeeze and a blow, and a squeeze and a blow. The problem with that is that doesn't come near, that, that doesn't do the job for achieving steady pressure. It just doesn't work that way. Because when you, as soon as you take your arm off the bag, now you're relying entirely on blowing, and I guess the, the stretchiness of the bag to do some work for you. And then as soon as you stop blowing, you gotta pump down and it just doesn't work. I've never seen anybody be able to manage that process. So what we do instead is you squeeze your arm on the bag and you keep it there. You keep the constant pressure with the arm, right? So it doesn't always look like that when you're watching somebody play, but you're blowing and as you blow, you're inflating the bag, bag inflates. And as the bag inflates, it pushes your arm up and then when you stop blowing, your arm comes in. And the way I think about it is it's not changing pressure, it's constant pressure, but the arm is moving, right? So the arm is moving as you inflate the bag, and then the arm comes in as the bag deflates when you're taking a breath. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And when I describe this concept to students, Sometimes they'll they'll say, okay, I got it, but really? They're like they're like skeptical, like really you don't relax your arm a tiny bit just to get it out? And the answer is you don't. You move your arm, actually let me let me you your arm moves as a result of you blowing into the bag. So you blow into the bag. Now there's a force, you know, there's there's you're you're using your lungs to blow air into the bag, and that air is inflating the bag and then it pushes your arm out right so you could think about what if instead of your arm what if you had a weight like one of those you know in the cartoons the big weight with the handle on the top of it what if you had one of those sitting on top of your bag and then as you blow into the bag and that's applying pressure downward pressure into that inflated bag as you blow into it the bag inflates and the weight moves up and when you take a breath the weight moves down it's as it pushes air out the weight is the same, right? The weight doesn't get heavier and then lighter and there's no force lifting it up other than the bag inflating. So that's how I want you to think about it, which is constant pressure with the arm and blow, and some people call it blowing the arm off the bag. It's not really blowing the arm off the bag because your arm does never comes off the bag, but it's blowing your arm out by inflating the bag. So let me just show you what that would look like here. I'm just going to cork my uh, cork my channel stock. movement over here. So there's very little movement of my elbow. It's just going, the arm comes in, moves out a little bit, comes in, moves out a little bit. The dead giveaway 
is it, you, first, you see this, you see the elbow, you see the kind of, they call it the chicken wing, it kind of, the elbow kind of comes out. So you want to watch for that. It's a constant, steady pressure with the arm. And if you haven't done this before, or if you haven't done it in a while, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel the burn up in the, up in the shoulder and then the, in the upper back. You're going to, and maybe in here a little bit, you're going to feel those muscles getting worked because it's a constant movement as opposed to a pump and release. So that's something you can try. <laughs> Now, one of the things that we could do in person, if we were having an in-person lesson, one of, and we we're working on this topic, one of the things that I would do is I would do this thing where I I squeeze and hold the pipes, and you do the blow pipe. So you blow, and I'll do I'll, I'll do the squeezing, right? And Usually what, what happens is that the, the, the student, when they're blowing into the blowpipe, it's often it's their pipes. So, okay, okay, Bob, give me your pipes. Let's try this. You blow on it, and then I squeeze. Often what happens is that the student finds it much harder to blow into the blowpipe than what they're used to. And, well, why would that be? They're their same pipes. Why would it be harder to blow in when I'm doing the squeezing? Well, it's because I'm maintaining that harder pressure with my elbow. Often what happens is that pipers, they don't even know they're doing it. But what happens is that you're squeezing hard, and just, just before you blow, you just relax your arm a little bit. And what does that do? Well, it lowers the pressure in the bag slightly, and then it allows you to blow into the bag more easily. It's easier to blow in the bag when there's lower pressure. And then when, when we're doing this demonstration and I'm squeezing the bag, I'm maintaining a higher pressure in the bag with my elbow, which makes it harder to blow in. So why is that a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because we're, we're maintaining a steadier pressure. And this is one of the things that you want to look out for, which is blowing at one pressure, squeezing at a different pressure. And that's, that can often happen when you're not doing the right job with the arm, right? So it's all about the arm. The blowing is easy. It's just blow into the bag, take a breath, blow into the bag, take a breath. Now, obviously, it takes some, you know, it takes some uh, physical stamina to do that. And, you know, the lips can go and then the diaphragm can get sore and that kind of thing. But in terms of the concept, it's just blow in, take a breath, blow in, take a breath. The hard work for maintaining the pressure throughout is done by the arm. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, Yuri, can you hear me? Yes, Steve. Yeah, so how, how much pressure is your way to measure? I mean, how much are, is Yuri pushing on his bag with his arm? You know, does that vary from, from the person? Or are there variables in there? I mean, should I be squeezing like with all my might like, constantly until I get a point where it's, it's easier? Good, really good question. So, okay. um, sounds like the question you're asking me is how hard do I need to squeeze? Like, what is the right amount of exertion? And well, that would depend on you got it. that would depend on how hard your pipes are, right? You can there are, you know, they sell reeds in different strengths and that kind of thing. And people, the strength of your pipes is going to be determined primarily by your chanter reed. Primarily, it's going to be determined by the strength of your pipe chanter reed. Okay, so um, that's a really great great question. So how do you know how hard What's the exact right pressure? Well, I want to bring in the, um, I want to show my, my gauge. Now, a lot of you guys know about my, um, the, uh, the bagpipe gauge, which is a specialized low pressure gauge, which 
it was actually my first product that I ever uh, started marketing. And it hooks up to your pipes and it measures precisely the pressure that's inside your bag. So I actually rigged it up here. Normally what you do is you, it has a little, um, has a little strap thing and you would hook it up right here on your blowpipe stock. And then it has a little tube and then the tube has a cork that attaches to, and I actually have one hooked up here. The tube attaches into the top of any one of your drones. And I have it just rigged up with a slightly longer tube to show you here. See if I can bring it into the uh, camera view here. There we go. Eh, sort of. Hang on, put my pipes on for a sec. Let's get this on here. <clears throat> I'm reflective off the lights, but let's see if I can do that. That's pretty good. Can you see that? Okay, so the way this thing works, it's an air pressure gauge and the cork that goes into the top of my drone, blow on that, measures the pressure. Okay, so let's see what happens here. So I'm just blowing my drones. So that was somewhere around 20, what was that, 24, 23 in there. Now I know from experience, my, when I put, plug my chanter in, it's gonna be higher pressure, because I know that the, the pressure of my chanter is a little bit higher. But this is one good thing to practice. You get your gauge, plug into one drone, now you got two drones going, you can get, get a stopper in your chanter stock there, and uh, give, give it a go. <laughs> So you can really see it. And the goal would be to have a little bit of move, uh, the least amount of movement possible. So you want to be somewhere in there. I would say if you're within like a one, that's really, really good. If you're, with, if you're within two, you're pretty good. If you're within five, you got some work to do. If you're more than five, you got, you got some serious practice to do here. So... I love this gauge because it helps you see visually what without the gauge you would just have to try to feel. People say you can do it by all oh, you got to do by by listening. That's basically impossible. You better you can do it by feel, but it's very hard to learn. Once you've achieved steady pressure, you can you can maintain it through feel. That's what all the good players do. It's very very hard to learn it. Um, learn steady blowing and steady arm pressure without the gauge. And take it from me, that was something I struggled with. That was something I struggled with a lot. So the goal is not to be beholden to this device, but this device will teach you, you know, what you need to do really, really quickly. So You love to play your pipes, and you know you love to play even more when your pipes sound and feel great. Whether you're still learning to blow steady, or you feel pretty good about it, but want to get even better, you can achieve the bagpipe sound and the confidence you want today with the bagpipe gauge. I've seen firsthand the fast and amazing results that you can achieve instantly when you first use the bagpipe gauge. So say goodbye to the guesswork of trying to figure out your blowing habits or the strength of your pipes. The bagpipe gauge makes it easy to see exactly what's happening and allows you to practice both effectively and efficiently. It's an amazing tool that will help make your pipes easier to play and easier to tune and will help you achieve that incredible, steady, and locked-in sound you deserve. Check it out today at bagpipelessons.com slash bagpipe gauge. Let's plug in the my pipe channer here.
clicks past straight up and down that's kind of right where i would where i expected them to be that is what i would call easy plus sort of been um people talk about reads order reads easy medium hard between easy and medium is what i call easy just on the over 30 and i think it's a really good strength easy or easy plus is about right for most people so to get to your question steve i'm saying yeah your pressure that you blow and squeeze that you want to maintain is determined by the pipe chanter read. Okay. Well, how do we know exactly? I'm going to blow up again and I can, I can blow maybe 25. The chanter reads going to be making a sound. I could blow out the 35 or 40. It'd still be, you know, how do you know? Like what's the, how right. Right. going to be? So you're, there's basically three operating pressures for your bagpipes. Right now we're at zero, which is no sound, no pressure. Then there's the drones kicking in pressure, which is lower, like when I was blowing without the chanter in, that was somewhere around 25. And then there's where the chanter reed kicks in. So I'll demonstrate those three. <laughs> So somewhere around 25 when I backed off, the channel read would cut out. So we know it has to be higher than that. And somewhere around 40, which I usually don't ever blow that hard, but somewhere around 40, my, one of my drones actually shut off. So we know it's going to be somewhere in that range. Anybody know the answer? It's not something that's, that you can necessarily figure out. It's something that was explained to me, and I'm, I'm going to share it if, if nobody else knows the answer. It's the high A. The high A is the note on all nine notes of the chanter. The high A is a magical note when it sounds really, really good. When you listen to a great player <clears throat> and that high A is really just singing, it has kind of a, a beautiful twinkling, kind of a twinkling kind of a quality to it. It's not, it's not like that and it's not, you get that crowy high A, we don't want that. But right in between that, a super piercing clear tone on the high end of pressure and <clears throat> that scratchy, crowy, almost cutting out on the low end of pressure, right in between there is a sweet spot for high A. And that's what we want to try to find. <laughs> So to me, it sounds right about there between 30 and 32, right there. Could you hear the difference in the high A when I first yeah, got yeah. out? It's not, it's, you know, not quite right. So the reason we use the high A is because the high A, it's just the physics of the, of the read, that high A has a range of qualities that it can get. And to nail that really, really nice high A with that sort of twinkling quality to it, there's a narrow range. So that's what we use. Every other note is a little bit more uh, accommodating, let's say that. Mm -hmm. You can blow harder or softer on other notes on the scale, 
and it'll change the pitch, but it doesn't change the quality of the sound as much mm -hmm. as the high A. So it's like you're having a dinner party, you invite all of the notes on your channel to dinner, and the high A is the note that has the restrictive diet, you know, no alcohol, <laughs> no dairy, no gluten, no vegetarian. It's like, that's the thing. It's like, okay, well, we're all eating celery because that's the only thing high A, high A can eat, right? So it's like the diva note. So it gets the, that, that determines the pressure. Now, you may find out that you go, you know, you after the session, you go, I'm going to get my gauge out. I'm going to figure out my pressure. You go to high A and you find out, oh my gosh, high A. It's like I got to blow 45 to get the high A to sound right. Well, that's a read problem. You know, your read is too hard. There's something going on. But so it, it's a balance here. We want to blow the read where it's happy, but we also want to find a pressure that's comfortable for you, right? So the good players that get a really good sound their pipes are set up right, and they're also blowing where they, where they feel comfortable, right? So I remember Malcolm McRae, the piper and judge, uh, he gave a seminar and he said something that always stuck with me. And he said, your pipes should be easy for you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, huh. Now, it's a two-way street there because if you're out, if you're just getting going, well, your pipes are not going to be easy for you because you're just trying to figure it out. But if you're in shape and you've learned how to do this, your pipe should be comfortable. You know, if you haven't played in a while, your pipes are not going to be easy for you when you get back to it after a break. That's normal. Your lips are going to go and that sort of thing. But if your pipes are set up properly and you're playing regularly so that you're in shape, your pipe should be easy for you. And the, the, only, other way, the, the only other way it could be would be your pipes are too hard for you and you're not going to play well if your pipes are hard for you right? There is a physical exertion component to playing the pipes as there is with a lot of instruments. So there's a physical conditioning component to it, you know, being in shape, playing so that the muscles are working. It's not just, it's not all mental, it's physical too. So, but I was, that always stuck with me. Wow. Okay. That's right. So that's the goal is to have your pipes be comfortable. So this gauge it's uh, the units here. There, there are different types of units of pressure. This is inches of water. And it's set up so that 30, which is right at the top there, is about right for most people. I've measured, I don't know, probably hundreds of people with this gauge. And there are people that are up on the high end, and there are people that are maybe down into the mid-20s. Some of the little kids or older people that have physical um, limitations but for most people i'd say 90 more than 90 percent maybe 95 percent of people are somewhere on either side of 30 right in that range and that can be comfortable for most people so maybe you're like yeah i really like 28 that's my sweet spot so that's fine you can still get a really good sound there and just the way that pipes are set up with the the air pressure and the reeds and the whole thing it's really hard to get a nice stable sound when you start getting like 25 or lower. It's just, they're not set up to be at that low pressure. Now on the upper end of things, um, you know, there are people that just like the 35 and up and it's like, okay, uh, to me, that's a little bit sort of masochistic that you would want to blow that hard. But those players tend to be players that are, are from sort of a little bit of a previous era in the no pain, no gain uh, era. And, it, it is true that it used to be hard to get it. It used to be very difficult to get a great sound um, on an easier read. But now that's not the case anymore. There are lots of really good reads and the channers are really efficient. So you can get a great sound even with, uh, you know, a read that's comfortable for you. So our goal using the gauge is total steadiness. You know, if you're if you're within a range of five, I'd say okay, you got some room to to go. If you're within a range of two, you're pretty darn good. And if you're Jerry, just kind of wiggling back and forth on one number, that's that's really really good. So that's what you're going for. Um, another thing I want to talk about is the proper muscles you're supposed to be using when you're blowing, right? So there's a lot of different things you could be doing here. Um, 
but the 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 proper way to do it is is it's all here right it's all shoulder and upper back it's none of this there's no bicep right so you're not pumping the bag in this way and i've seen people that end up doing this and sometimes you'll see people use this kind of shoulder action that's usually to compensate when the other muscles aren't strong enough or they're not coordinated enough. Sometimes you see little kids doing this because they're really, they're just really trying to get it going and they don't quite have the muscle strength yet. So that's another, um, a reason that when you're starting out, if your instructor's doing it right, they will set up your pipes to be a little bit on the easy side so that you can figure everything out. There's, believe me, there's enough physical exertion required even when your pipes are, are set up easy. So, the the drill that that I like to do for people or, or show is, and I'll show you this now, which is blow up, play high A. Just hold a high A best you can, and then take your hand off the chanter, still playing high A, and then straighten your arm out and maintain high A. Now I'm gonna do this and you know you'll you might see a little bit of, of moving in the needle there because it's, you know, it's much harder when you sort of have your arm out here versus where, where you're used to be in your sweet spot. But the idea and, and the, the purpose of this exercise is to isolate the correct muscles. By, by taking the arm out, I'm taking my forearm completely off the back, and it prevents me from doing any of this kind of movement, right? So if you've ever been to physical therapy or to a trainer and they have you do, okay, go like this, do this, move this muscle, and whoa, yeah, it's like it, it pinpoints a certain muscle group. So that's what we're doing here is we're focusing everything up here. So, and if it feels hard to do uh, with the um, with the chanter in, you can just do the, the drones. In fact, I'll do that now so I can speak to you while, if I need to while I'm doing this. with the tanner on high A or just the drones. I got my arm out here. You know, so I'm making it a little bit easier on myself by corking the chanter, you know, down into the 20s there. And I'm going to try it with the chanter plugged in. And this is a much more bigger challenge here. And I'm doing it with the bagpipe gauge on video, just for the record. For all of posterity. Yeah, I can feel it. I can feel the burn. So that's good. <clears throat> so that is the good, um, that's a good exercise to do. Okay. Um, now let's talk about, any questions on that so far? I want to talk, about, yes. Yes, so, so, so you're pressing the, against the egg with your forearm. That's not where the pressure is coming from. It's coming from backwards your elbow. Oh, it should be if you're doing it properly. Yeah, it's coming from your elbow. Yeah, it is. But there are people that you will see, and that they 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 do they have a lot of this action with the other arm here. But they but they they, they do a little bit of action here, and you can actually see the the wrist bend, and they sort of bring they they're sort of doing a little bit of this. And the problem with that right. is that your hand is on the chanter. So if you start bending your forearm, then you start getting this wrist kind of action. So that's no good. So if you look at, 
videos of top players, you will see a couple things. You'll see the arms are here. The forearms are just about horizontal or a little bit down. It's not this. You don't see the arms reaching down. Sometimes you see people that are really tall and their arms are doing that. That's no good. And the reason you want to be here is you want a straight shot here. Your fingers are parallel with your arm bones. You know, you don't want to be doing any kind of this action, right? You don't want to be having to turn. So you want your fingers to be straight with your arms. And, you're, and, the, and the chanter holes are this way. So if your hands start to do this, now your fingers are out of line with where the chanter is going to be, so then you have to start twisting your wrists, and it becomes a real problem. I look at pictures of me when I was a little kid before I figured this stuff out, and I'm really reaching my head's way back because the blowpipe's too long, and I'm reaching down for that chanter, and it's not nearly as ergonomic as just being right here. So you look at top players, and it's going to be here, Forearms are parallel or very slightly down, and the wrists are very in the neutral position. You don't see this or this, right? So you sometimes see people doing this. That's problematic. You want your wrists to be neutral. Stuart Little is really good for that. Look, at, look up pictures of Stuart, and you can see he's pretty much the ideal ergonomics, just the way that his, uh, his body and his pipes fit together. Okay. Cool. So I want to... Um, I want to talk about some blowing exercises that we can do. So you, you got your, you know, we've, you've done the arm thing to figure out that you're using the proper muscles. Um, you've got your gauge, you've figured out where your pipes want to be somewhere around 30 and they're set up there and they're comfortable there. So then how do we, how do we go from just blowing a note to being able to maintain this steady pressure in our tunes. I mean, a common thing is, oh gosh, I can do pretty good when I'm just sitting there practicing just the low A and I'm staring at the gauge, but as soon as I go into tune, it all goes kaput. So how do we do that? Well, th the idea is you need to get good enough at doing this by really think, first you have to be really paying attention to it and focusing on it and thinking about it. And then it starts to become a little bit more automatic. And as it becomes more automatic, you're able to devote some of your thoughts and your focus to things that you're playing. But it's not just going to be, you know, okay, I can blow away and now I can go straight into my hardest tune that I'm working on. So it's sort of an incremental process. So the way I do it is the first thing is you want to be able to just hold low A and you want to be able to hold it for a couple minutes. The next thing you want to do is what I call the slow scale. Now this would be the scale, but really slow, like four breaths per note. You're just holding low, low G and you're there for four breaths or more. And then um, all the way up the scale and all the way back down again. The next one is the slow scale, but put a high A in between every note. So you're going to low G, and then before you go to low A, put a high A. And then you're at low A. Then you put a high A, and then a B, and then a high A, and then a C. So you're doing the scale, but you're alternating, sticking a high A in between. And that's really good because, remember, the high A is the note that we use to um, figure out our correct pressure. So that's a really, really good one. And that gives you that, that um, switching back between the top hand and the bottom hand, and that's really good. So after you've done that high A slow scale, the next thing I would do is I would go to your simplest, easiest tune, like the easiest one. It may be the first tune you learned, or maybe that one you've, you've moved on from that. Something really simple, something that is like a slow air for sure, or maybe a little bit of P-Brock that isn't too, you know, not a new one where you're still trying to figure everything out. And the idea there is now we want to get into something a little more musical, something with maybe some embellishments, but still not too much so you can still be paying attention to what's going on with the arm and the blowing and the gauge. So it's sort of an incremental process.
And you may find, oh gosh, well, I can do a bar, but then I sort of forget where I am with the blowing and it all falls apart. So maybe you just do a bar. Just do a bar of a tune and hold the note for four breaths. Get back settled with your blowing and then play the next bar. Get to the end of that bar, hold the note for four breaths, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a gradual process of going from I'm thinking about the gauge and my arm and the steady blowing 100% of the time, and then you're just sort of inching up on getting closer and closer to a tune. Let me just let me just demonstrate what that some of that might look like. <clears throat> Notice anything? Any comments? So these are some of the things you're looking for. Our goal is that you're at the right number for your pipes, for your read, for your high A, and that the minimum amount of fluctuation. Now you can see there, it's just a little bit, a little bit of fluctuation, um, but that's your goal, right? So here's what you want to try to figure out. When it's not perfectly steady, when is it not perfectly steady? And try to figure out why. There are a few common things that are specific problems that people have that we can talk about here. One of them is blowing versus squeezing, or I should say, blowing and squeezing versus just squeezing. Sometimes you'll see there's a little bit of a change there, right? A really common problem is the weak arm, which is the arm isn't quite doing the pressure. And you see this where if you feel like you have to blow all the time and you're afraid of taking a breath or you're afraid of taking a long breath, you're just gasping, maybe that you have a weak arm. Now, it may just be physically weak, but it may not, you may have the physical strength, you may just need to be applying more of that strength so that when you are taking a breath, the pressure is maintained. So you look for that, if you see, oh, I'm pretty good when I'm blowing, and as soon as I take a breath, it starts to sag, 
All right? So then what you need to do is you need to make sure that you're applying more pressure with your arms so that when you take that nice big breath, that it maintains that pressure. So that's a really common one is to look for sagging on the squeeze only versus blow. Okay? So it may be that you need to build up some stamina and strength in the arm. It may be that you just need to apply more pressure to the arm than you're used to doing. Right? And what that will do on one hand, uh, it's you're exerting more in the arm, but then you get to actually take a proper breath on the inhale and you're not just having to blow all the time. Right. So it's a bit of a mental thing, too, when you switch from the practice chanter to the pipes, because on the chanter, you're used to blowing all the time that you're playing. As soon as you take a breath, it stops. Right. So it's different on the pipes. You need to sort of disconnect that. Oh, I can keep playing. The tune can keep going. The sound keeps going even when I'm inhaling. Right. Kind of like the, I remember the first time I did a scuba diving thing in the swimming pool. 20 some odd years of my life learning to not inhale when you're underwater, right? It's like, okay, I can do that. And then it's sort of a, 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 a thing, you know? So same thing here. It's like, you, you got to get used to taking a big, deep inhale. The music keeps going and you maintain the pressure from the arm. Just like in that demonstration that I talked about where in person we could do it, where I would be squeezing your pipes, you'd be blowing and you'd find, oh, I got, it's harder to blow in when you're already squeezing on the bag. But that's exactly right, because I'm maintaining the pressure with my arm instead of slacking to make it easier to blow. Uh, once you've achieved that, a nice constant pressure on the blow and the squeeze, you may see that there's a little bit of a hiccup, of, uh, just a little bit of a flutter of the needle on the transitions. So that's a common thing that you'll see, which is blows pretty good, squeeze and blow, or the the blow and squeeze is pretty good, and then the squeeze only is pretty good, but just on the transitions, right before I initiate a breath, or right before I uh, finish a breath, there's a little bit of a blip there. So just watch for that. That's often caused by, again, it's sort of an unconscious thing that pipers do, which is they're squeezing really good, and when, they, when they're into their blow, it's really good, but right before they, just right before they start the squeeze, their arm just does a little bit of a relaxation move. Again, it's to just kind of make it easier to blow into the bag. So the way that you eliminate that is just focus on that arm and make sure that as I'm blowing, I'm thinking there's an arrow, you know, the arrow, the direction of the air is going inside. I want to maintain that back pressure with the arm. So as I'm just about to initiate the blow, make sure that you're nice and strong there. The other thing that can make that, add to that particular problem is that when you're starting your blowing, you're at the most deflated position on the arm. And it can be a little bit harder to get leverage down here than up here. So when you're the almost maximum deflated position, just before that, and you go to blow, um, you want to make sure that you maintain good, strong arm there. Hey, York. Yes. Uh, so I've heard... Uh, blowing versus squeezing, maybe 80%, 80%. I've heard like 75, 25. You got any, any thoughts on that? Uh, nobody actually knows the numbers because they're just pulling stuff okay. out of thin okay. air. I, you know, it's actually a fascinating topic. I'd love to like video. I'd like to, you could easily do it. We could do it right now. Get on YouTube with a stopwatch and Callum Beaumont or Stuart or me or whoever. You could measure it. Right, right. Um, I think most people the, are maybe too much on the blow versus the squeeze. Okay. It's just, it's squeezing too much doesn't seem to be a problem because you just run out of air and then, then your pipes just stop, you know, or you're going to be squeezing so far down, right? So I think the problem that most people have is they, they blow too much of the time and it's related to the weak arm problem, which is they're really not comfortable being off of the blow for very long because the pressure dips and i've seen that many many times which is we're looking at the gauge pretty good and then it kind of goes then it comes back up and it's these small little dips and every one of those dips are at the, the the short time where the piper is not blowing so the answer is not to 
blow more, the answer is you got to figure out how to maintain the pressure with the arm while you're not blowing, right? If you're doing it right, your pipes get enough air and you get enough air, right? Your pipes need air to keep making a sound. You need air so that you have oxygen to your brain so you don't fall over. So if you're doing it right, um, it's comfortable, right? And you look at good players and they're, you know, experienced players don't even have to be that good on the playing side, but people who can blow their pipes properly, they can play for a while. And it's not like they're gonna, they're dying after five minutes, right? You wanna be able to get through, okay, I can get up, I can play an eight minute peep rock, no problem. I can do 12 minutes. You ought to get to that, that point in terms of having your instrument set up and your physical conditioning as a piper is adequate and you've got the blowing and squeezing cycle down so that you're getting the air you need and the pipes get the air that it wants, that it needs to, right? So you're not hyperventilating, right? So I don't know if it's 75, 25 or 80, 20 or 60, 40. Those are just made up numbers that don't mean anything, right? So what I, what I would do is I would go through all these things we've talked about today, get the gauge, get your high A pressure, make sure you're using your arm and not your, your bicep, go through some of these drills, and, you know, you may find out that, oh, gosh, well, I, I, this is what I need to do different now, and this is what I want to do it. And, you know, one of the things you can do is take a video, just video yourself doing it. You can actually video yourself and the gauge. That's a good one. If you can find a way to mount your gauge somehow, like I've done it, and then you get the you get your camera set up, filming the gauge. Is it amazing what you'll find out? You go, oh my gosh! Every time I play high A, the the pressure spikes by five. But why are you, why are you doing that? It doesn't do that on its own. You do that. Well, why do you do that? Well, maybe you go, well, if I don't do that, my high A sounds terrible. It's like under pressure. Well, if your high A wants 32 and you want to be at 25, it, 32 is the number, right? So you either got to find a way to make that read a little bit easier to be comfortable for you, or you got to blow the read where, where, where it wants to be blown. So there should be a sweet spot where it feels good to you, the read sounds good, and then with practice and physical conditioning, you can do it for a long time. Um, we're getting close to the end here. There's one other thing to watch out for. This is less common, but you may notice that the needle actually moves in time with the music. So this, this happens, and sometimes you see that, you know, and what that means is that you're doing a little bit of a exertion with your arm on certain embellishments. So I've seen that. I've seen a guy where, oh, his pressure gauge is just moving with the beat. It's like, that's no good, right? So he's definitely, he's sort of doing, you know, trying to do in grace notes and, and uh, top hand embellishment in there, and it's translating into a full arm movement, which is no good. So just watch for that. The goal is that there would be no connection at all between the pressure and what you're playing. No connection at all, right? So we don't want to be able to see on the gauge that, oh, every time a person plays a high A, it's a different pressure. We don't want to see any kind of reflection of the tempo of the tune that you're playing or the beat or anything, right? Whether you're playing low A for five minutes or you're playing the Mason's Apron or you're playing a P Brock, the, the pressure in the bag should not reflect any of that. Now, it may a little bit, but, you know, because you're human and all the parts of your brain are all interconnected. But what you're trying to do as much as you can is develop independent independence there so that you're maintaining pressure. And through using the gauge and through going through these exercises we've talked about, you get really good at it when you focus on it. And then you can still be really good at it. And it's happening in a more automatic way, right? Like we can walk down the street and have a conversation. And we don't fall over. Right, so same thing here, it's sort of, this is like, it becomes a, a cyclical thing that you do um, with less and less conscious 
um, you know, conscious effort, right? And then when you get really good at it, you can, you can close your eyes and you can feel it. You can feel that pressure, right? That's how, that's how we all do it. We're not all running around performing with these pressure gauges, but you use it as a tool to really um, refine your internal sense of pressure so you know how hard to blow. Just like a trumpet player would do, they know how to blow harder on those high notes, or just like the violinist knows how to push on the strings the right strength, they don't have a little pressure gauge on their fingers. But we have this device which makes it really easy, makes it easy to see what's going on and makes it much easier to master this, uh, this super important skill. So if you're thinking you'd like to get your hands on a bagpipe gauge, what are you waiting for? I designed it specifically to help you dramatically improve your blowing skill. It helps you make your pipes more efficient, enjoyable to play, and quickly improves that number one skill you need to master, steady blowing. Visit bagpipelessons.com slash bagpipe gauge to learn more and get yours today. It's the tool you've been waiting for to achieve that sweet locked in sound. If you enjoyed this video, you'll definitely want to check out my bagpipelessons.com inner circle. I host live group classes nearly every week where we dive into all of the most important piping topics. Each session is recorded, giving you the flexibility to watch or rewatch anytime or anywhere. As a member, you gain exclusive access to my lesson library, packed with hundreds of hours of tunes, lessons and videos, along with personalized support from me to help you make your piping dreams a reality. Whether you're a beginner or looking to elevate your piping skills to the next level, or even if you're just seeking a fresh new approach, I work hard to ensure there's something for everyone at the Inner Circle. To learn more about joining, visit bagpipelessons.com slash membership. And download my free guide called How to Get a World Class Sound. The link is in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. And if you found this video helpful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to click the little bell icon to get notified every time I post a new video here on the bagpipelessons.com YouTube channel. For even more videos, lessons, and free guides, head on over to bagpipelessons.com learn. Thanks, and happy piping!